Okay, that's five minutes. So now two minutes, two minutes debrief to each other. And, and then we'll, start, we'll let you know when two minutes is up and then we'll do five minutes of swap over. All right, so go two minutes now, debrief. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll do another session. Yep. Okay, everyone. Need to stop your debrief now. So swap over. So the clinician is now Pat and vice versa, and you've now got five minutes from now.
Okay, so you've now got two minutes of debriefing. To, hello, everyone. Two minutes of debriefing, and then we'll bring you back to as a whole group to talk about it for a few minutes before morning tea. All right, two minutes to go. I'll just leave uh, and wondering. Yeah, so I'll leave that up there if you want to use it. Okay, everybody. All right, everyone. really useful. Yeah. Is there anything you want to add? No, I think having that, that language, that, that wonder worry language was great. The patient was very agreeable though, yeah. <laughs> which helped. <laughs> yeah. um, you'll be surprised how many are though once you get the last, if you're honest and trusting and just talking about it, this stuff is underneath people. It is really hard. I mean, I've been in hospital. It's really hard. No one cares a stuff about what you think. I just wanted to ask a question, please. Um, just about using the word die in these conversations, you know, and sort of being a bit more direct um, because I, I personally feel that sometimes if you don't physically use that word, people just don't get it. What's everybody else think? Yeah. The D word is quite good, I think, as long as you're nice about it. But 
But I think dying isn't the thing that worries people the most. It's the process that's a lot more, more worrying for people. So I'm worried that, you know, how do you feel about this? You know, and getting to exercise, I'm terrified about this process. I think I'm worried that you're in the last stage, that this is coming to, you know, this is coming to, a, to an end. You know, we're getting to the last phase or something. I mean, I say that. I try not to use the D word unless they're, unless they're you know, not seeming to get it, in which case I do. And certainly when I do the tour of treatment ones, I always use the D word. But in these ones, you might just talk about the, you know, the, the bumpy bit coming ahead. I use the D word. Yeah. But I'm not going to say that it's bad to use the D word. If you can get away with it and do it in a nice way that doesn't you know, get you into trouble, it's great. I suppose just what is the toolkit that you might use for somebody who's really obstructive and in denial and not willing to be part of that story, feels that they're going to have a very um, unrealistic outcome. What, how would you approach that? So that's another skill which I didn't actually do here but came through the same group, actually. So unrealistic hope. How do you deal with unrealistic hope? So let's imagine I'm, I've got metastatic uh, pancreatic cancer uh, I've had two rounds of chemo and the thing's quadrupled in size. The oncologist is reasonably happy that it's not, it could have been worse without the chemo. And they're organising me, uh, they're organising me a Magimab from, uh, you know, to give, give me, which has huge toxicity and has never worked in this condition, but he thinks it might. And I'm very hopeful. What do you do? Do you come across this? Unrealist, utterly unrealistic hope. Well, initially, you probably have to start from the beginning and give them fully full information as to the process of their disease and what has happened to date. It's true, Charlie. Quite well, not quite as <laughs> bluntly as that, <laughs> but... Um, be realistic. Be, be realistic terrible. and say... Will I like you? Probably not. Yeah. Probably not. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've done this for years, and, I've done, I think, and, and before I had the, went to the course, I did the wrong thing. Um, and, and actually, in the course, I'm great. They got all these hexalists doing. We all said, you're, 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 you know, be realistic is hopeless. And and then they asked the the, uh, the actor, how do you think about? What do you feel about them? Hate them, hate them, horrible. I'm holding on with my fingernails. I know it's unrealistic, and I'm doing my very best to be optimistic. And it's really hard because the thing's doubling every 24 hours, and I'm trying to be optimistic. You know, the evidence is all bad. And the harder it, the, 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 the more difficult it becomes, the harder it is to be re be optimistic. So it becomes more and more of a struggle. And when someone starts stamping on your fingers, it's really nasty. So the clue to this that they gave was, what about you actually get on board with my hope? Can you do that? I'd like to hope that Magic Man will be fabulous as well. Never been tried before, but I'd love that. Wouldn't that be wonderful, Charlie? Wouldn't that be great? If Magic Man just was that amazing breakthrough, that, you know, once in a generation amazing thing, and that it just made it melt away. Wouldn't that be fabulous? And would I like you if you say that? Yeah, I love you. Very nice. Lo very lovely girl. And then what you say? The next sentence you say, however, if it doesn't, should we make some plans? Because what chance do you think of Magic Man being fabulous for all the years? Anything above nil? Little tiny. Nil. So you don't have to ignore it. Move around it and just move to the uh, the idea that it'll be, um, what about some other things? And the children, the Bill talked about this, the, people, the healthcare people, the children, the parents. What, what parents agree to, to stop treating their children? What does, but what's the first thing that parents hope for with their ch child when you go and see them? Well, they hope for a magic cure, don't they? Something, you know, light through the window and music and all loveliness. And that's what everyone hopes for. But you say, after that, what do you hope for? And they hope that their death isn't going to be horrible. So you don't take long to get past it. It's, but why take that away? Leave that ridiculous loveliness and ignore it. Just Instead of bang, banging it, just go around it and carry on. Charlie, you're not ignoring it, you're acknowledging it. You're acknowledging it and leaving it there. Yeah, don't, don't and, try and to bash it down. It's hard to bash it down and be light. So just ignore it. And Charlie, some people talk about hope for the best, plan for the worst, or hope for the best, plan for the rest. So you don't use those terms, but it's about 
acknowledging they're still hoping that things are going to go well, but if they don't, what are we going to discuss? What are we going to put in place? Any other questions? Um, Jeff Shaw from New Zealand. I, I would also like to raise the importance of bringing in the family. Um, it, it's particularly important with Māori in New Zealand, the whanau, and their cultural views are quite different from the absolute autonomy that we practice in sort of white Anglo-Saxon land. And so I would often put it with families, who wants to be involved in these discussions or who should I talk to? So you actually set the ground rules quite clearly at the beginning rather than just grabbing the patient and saying, listen, let's have a conversation. Yeah. And you bring in that support person so it makes it easier for them to make the decision. I think that's probably fairly important at the beginning. Yeah, well, family are essential in these conversations. And, uh, but you can have conversations with patients and then you can bring the family in if, the pa if that's how the, pa the patient want to do it. And often I find patients, well, I get called to see patients and there may or may not be family there. Um, and often patients will have these conversations at weird times when they just feel like it. So Charlie, should we stop now so our group don't miss out on all the scones? <laughs> I think so. so. We're going to come back and we'll do some more um, and, and, and try and refine So we'll, the see, we'll see you in half an hour. Worry and wonder. Just yeah. go back out past the stairs, turn left. That's where the refreshments are and we'll see you at five past eleven. And then we'll go through till um, before the conference starts. Okay, we're going to get underway now. We have uh, 54 minutes and 30 seconds because we're going to stop at 12, because I'm sure you'll all want to go and get the lunch. I apologise that there weren't scones out there. I suppose that I was dreaming rather than anything else. That I heard we had a bit of a catastrophe, because when we got out there, was there was no coffee initially. So, hey? Well, um, such is life. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I reflect back on what you were saying about, let's hope for something, but if it doesn't work, what's next? <laughs> okay, so um, what we're gonna do now is just a little bit more role play. Uh, all the workshops I've been running over the years, the evaluation we get, people always say, in some ways it's a daunting bit, but invariably people say it's often the best part of workshops where you actually get a chance to, right. to practically um, engage in what this is all about. So we're going to do another role play now. So um, this is a, a variation on what what uh, Charlie presented to you before to do with Pat. So this is where you're going to practice talking to a patient who's currently in the ICU, who's about to go out to the ward having recovered from pneumonia and they've also got some heart failure. And you're going to talk to them about, it's great you're getting better, but if you were to get sick again, remember those three things, the three steps. Firstly, in the same way that Charlie was talking about, it's, you know, that, you know, they're always hoping for the best. So it's great to see you're recovering from the pneumonia, but if you were to get worse again, and we couldn't talk to you, who do you want us to talk to? And then once you've got that done and dusted, is everyone with us at the moment? Secondly, once you've worked out who to talk to, what would you want if you were to get sick again? Do you want to come back to the intensive care unit? What would be your values around that? What's the outcome and so on? And then if you want to, you can talk about if you were to get very sick and your heart was to stop, what you're going to do with that. All right? So I, I'm deliberately not scripting it too much. I'm not having anything up there because I want you guys to go with intuitively what's working for you. 
as the patient and how the clinician handles that and then you as the clinician handling it, not knowing what they're going to say. So we're going to run this for five minutes and then two minutes debrief and then swap over and then two minutes debrief just like we did before. Because we don't need to go on for a long time, really just want you to get a sense of how to have that sort of discussion. Remembering the aim is to get a sense of what they want and what they don't want in terms of outcome and then getting that documented, we're not going to discuss that right now, but getting that documented so that if they do deter out on the, out on the ward, then we know whether it's going to be a MET call or a code blue or whether we're going to be keeping them comfortable. Sorry, Charlie, you wanted to add something? No, I thought you'd finished. No, I was just going to make a suggestion about how we organised it. So keep going. When you finish, I'll make oh, a no. suggestion on how to organise it. Now's good. So I think it's very important that you don't talk to the same person you did before, and I suggest that you just mix up and go to someone that you never, you don't know at all, and um, and do that. And then when we do the second one, we'll do that. We'll move again because I think seeing different styles is very important. So Charlie's big on speed dating. Yeah. And it, I, <laughs> <laughs> and it's really good, as he says, don't do it with someone that you did it before and then when we swap over after five minutes, we'll you'll change, change again. yet again. Because you hear different words from different people, different styles. Okay. Uh, some of the words work for you, some don't. You'll hear things that won't work for you. You can't do it. So, yeah. They don't take long to get going, do they? You can no. start their timer. Yeah, it makes it a bit more... All right, so we'll stop you in five minutes. Go for it. No, that's good. Thanks for reminding me about that. I forgot completely. What? Moving about them around. Yeah, yeah, sorry. That's right. Well, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. I'll do the thing. I think you'll be, you'll be surprised at how well that goes without having to do a whole lot of formal role playing. Oh, oh God, yes, no, 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 it's good. Yeah, 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 that's so good. Just get them a heads up, moving them around. No, no, we've done very well. The speed dating thing and moving them around, little short bits, little experiment, and then do it again and again. It's about getting that first bit of language going. Once you've been in a conversation for a few minutes and you haven't stuffed it up, you can go anywhere you like. But the, the first bit is very important, breaking the ice. And that's why I was trying to say with the values thing, you're just under the surface. We're all terrified. We're all terrified of this stuff. So the idea that, you know, you, you just keep going back to theatre and you have more stents and other things...
pace, so unless they pull but it least, out incredibly But at least picking pace where you're going. Okay, that's that's five minutes. So, time, time. So up. time to time to do two minutes debrief. What was that like? Particularly, I want you as the patient to tell the clinician what was that like. Did they stuff it up? Did they make you feel awful? Did they make you feel like you trusted them? Those are the sort of things we're going to talk about. And then I'll give you two minutes, and then we'll change over. Go for it. All right, so that's, um, that's two minutes debrief. So just before we change over to doing the next five minutes where you swap the roles, one of the questions I want to ask you is, five minutes in some ways seems to go very quickly, but are you surprised at how much you can actually get through in that five minutes? Much more than you would imagine. So normally the whole thing about having an advanced care planning discussion or an end-of-life care discussion, you can see how in many ways it's much the same. It's just the, the time issues. Normally in the past you'd think it's really daunting and it's going to be difficult and so on, but you can really cover quite a lot just in that short period of time. So remember that when you go back to work next week, that this is something you can engage in a lot more. And just because you're nurses, and I mean that in a, in a flippant way, if you get trained and develop practice in this, you can play a really valuable role and you shouldn't allow your intensive care doctor colleagues to downplay that important role in terms of advocating for and finding out what your patients want and then going back and saying to the doctor, look, I've actually had a talk to Mrs Jones. She said she's really appreciated everything everyone's done and she, but she knows her limitations and if she got sick again, um, she really wouldn't want to come back to ICU. How about we fill out one of those goals of care documents? So you as intensive care nurses can be real catalysts in making sure that you improve the way this has been handled. So just leave you with that idea. I'd like you to 
Oh, Could I just let you expand on that with the nurses? We did a little study where we had a, uh, an end of life. This is before we started doing our current uh, program, so I hope that things aren't quite as bad now. But um, we had an actor, and they were seen by six consultants, six registrars, and six experienced ICU nurses. And this was a patient very similar to the respiratory failure one on the ward. And the six unselected consultants, what do you reckon they did when they saw her? No. Probably got her name wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so they told her, you're stuffed, you're going to die. And I'm not taking you to ICU. Did she like, the, did she like any of the specialists? No. Didn't Bloody I. doctors. Yeah. So then the, then the registrars, what do the registrars do? Sorry? Ask her what she wanted, rubbish. Yes, do you want us to do everything? And they suggested we could put a mask on. And they, so their goal was to bring her to ICU, but not to intubate her. But she could have an NIV and definitely be admitted to ICU. And because it's about doing something. Hundred, all of them, all, all of them did that. What about the nurse? What did they do? Listen to her, talk to her about what she wanted, and came to a conclusion that it would be better to stay on the ward and, and have analgesia and talk to the doctor there. Which one did the actor like the best by far? So, there you go. So it can be done, and it's really a, it's an important part of the whole process. Um, uh, we're trying to teach the doctors, but uh, you know it's already there. And uh, you know, in the middle of the night, people come up with this stuff. You know, when people say, "What's it all for?" You know, you don't say, "Oh, put you know." So it up. nurses are fabulous at talking to patients, but particularly listening to patients. And so don't undervalue mm. your ability, your skills, your experience, and your role in this area, and don't let the doctors undervalue what you do. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, right, that, swap over. Do, are we going to talk, we do that at the end? Yeah, swap so over. swap over with someone else so you're not now doing a different role. You're doing a different role, but make sure you're doing it with another person, the speed bait, that dating bit. Yeah. And so if you were a doctor last five time, minutes. find a person who's switch round. I want you to be the opposite and move round. <laughs> did you publish that? No, Sharon's got it. It's nice. It's very nice. It's it just said the doctors just were. They, you know, so they're all the consultants.
That's that's five minutes. Okay, so two minutes of discussion. Okay, two minutes of debrief. And then we're gonna and think about and what you're gonna share. Two minutes of debrief. Um Okay, everyone, that's great. Let's all come back together as a whole group. So now you've, you've all done two role plays each before the break and now after the break. So we just want to spend five minutes two. giving... Two to five minutes. <laughs> just getting feedback from you, particularly what was it like as a patient in terms of feeling a level of trust about what was coming up but any clinicians who want to talk about, but we only want to spend two to five minutes on this because then we've got a couple of other things to do. So, very quickly, who wants to talk about what it was like as the patient having people talk to you about these things? Any things that particularly worked or particularly didn't work? Has anyone had any experiences that were particularly good or particularly bad? No. What, so it was all just bland? Was it... Yes. Was, <laughs> It was a beige experience, was it? I think it's difficult to simulate. Yeah. It's difficult to simulate the patient response because we're all trained as medical professionals. Yes, yes. And so we are kind of guiding answers yeah. as yeah. to where we know the conversation will go or what would be a nice con constructive conversation to have. So mm, putting it yeah. in a different yeah. workshop where you have actors would be yeah. completely different. Yeah. We haven't got the money. <laughs> <laughs> But to hear it, so to hear it coming back, to hear the, the, the thing. So hearing is that when you're playing the patient, hearing worry, does that sound all right? Hearing wonder, you know, a, a hypothesis for how we might go forward, do those seem to work for you as patients? Yeah. Non-threatening. Non and so that's the things I want you to take away, those two, worry and wonder. Yep. Yeah, I th it actually flows beautifully, I would say. It's, it's non-confrontational. Yeah. It's not... Challenging and actually it's almost like holding your hand and bringing you down that path yeah. to sort of contemplate and consider Yeah, um, yeah. I've been on okay. the receiving end of intensive care as well as sort of uh, Working in it um, and had you know a gang of gastric surgeon um, gastroenterology and General surgeons and vascular surgeons do stuff with me and had the overly on un um, optimistic oncologists thereafter and um, And I can remember basically at one point yeah, asking the oncologists about my sort of you know possible future and everything else. I said, oh, you know, so and so, this, whatever. And the, the, you know, they are overly optimistic. And of course, what you do is you go and basically go on up to date and everything else and pull off the, 
the data that you, you know, get some more objective data. But, um, and so from a patient point of view, I can see how quite often, if there's any sort of, you almost feel pressured in most cir circumstances um, to, s to agree with the clinician who is in front of you. Yep, yep. But, the wor the, but this method is not basically trying to get you to agree. It's bringing you down that path of contemplation and then suggesting, which I think is a wonderful way of doing it. Good. In some ways, um, I think having this conversation in the traditional Anglo-Saxon model is, is, in my experience, very straightforward. Um, with some of the ethnic minorities, it's a far more challenging discussion to have. Have you any tips to guide well, us? Yeah, my tips to guide you are, let's get the simple one worked out right first and do it properly. <laughs> Because I go to these courses, you know, course in the, you know, I'm trying to teach the registrars, and they're going, show me difficult ones. You say, no, you can't do a simple one. Do the simple one first, and then we can do the other. I mean, obviously, with a, you know, like a Greek or Italian family, you've got several, and, or, you know, with uh, uh, fractured families, there's several different people, all with different agendas and different positions and different perceptions of what mum's values are, and it's all over the place. And it's, a, you know, it's about listening and everything else. It's just lots more complicated. But I think in all education things, it's better to try and start out simple and get the, t get the skills all good. Um, and again, the wondering, worrying and wondering, however aggressive they are, your worries matter. And the wonder thing, you know, is about, you know, it's like putting your f foot in the piranha pond. If all the flesh is ripped off it, it's only your toe. Do not go naked into the pool, you know, straight away, which is what the registrars do in difficult family conversations. So my advice is go gently and don't, you know, leap in and get ripped apart. I, I might have a slightly different metaphor. <laughs> um, when you're learning how to put in a drip, you yeah. start with the patients with the good yeah. veins, yeah. develop your technique, yeah. so that when you come to a patient with not so good veins, you still make sure you get the bevel in, you still make sure you feed the tube down properly. So practice all the time. Start off with the easy ones so you know you'll go away with confidence yep. that you've gone okay with that. And then you'll start to build the confidence of how to deal with the difficult ones. Any now, other, I, any other I, last? Can I stop, Bill? Because um, <laughs> I've got here three. We, we've done for the training that we do for the college for the trainees um, some tapes of three approaches to doing a conversation with the same patient. And I'd like you to watch it, and I'd like us just to deconstruct it afterwards. All right? So number one. Thanks for meeting with me. It's a very important conversation that I need to have with you. Um, look, things aren't going very well with your dad's treatment. And uh, I need to tell you that, that I think um, it's time that, that we stop his life support. Stopped? Yeah. What, what, what do you mean stopped? Yeah, look, your dad's very sick, as you yeah, know. Yeah, I, I know. I've been <coughs> looking after him. Mm. It's all I've got, man. I mean, stop him. Yeah. Look, this is, I know this is very hard for you, but you need to understand that your dad's got a lot of health problems, even before this, this admission to hospital. Yeah, well, well, I know that. Yeah. But you're supposed to help him. You're supposed to keep, you know, do something. Just yeah. what you say you are. Do something. Yeah. You, you can't stop. Look, I think you need to understand that we've done everything we can. Um, and uh, this is, I think you need to, uh, to be a bit realistic about, about <laughs> where this is. Being realistic? I've been looking after the man for months. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, no. I, I, I know this is really hard, but you need to understand that. But he's all I've got, mate. Yeah. Yeah? And me and him. Mum's dead. Mm. Th th you know, it's just us. Mm. No. Mm. Now you can't stop. You've got to do what you can do. do th there must be other stuff. It must be. You need to accept that, that we've done everything we can for your dad, and uh, I think you, you need to appreciate that. No, 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 I don't. I, I don't think you've done enough, and I, I don't think you should stop. I think there's more you should do. There's, there's got to be more that you can do. Yeah, look, I no, think, we'll get them to debrief uh, it. You know, I think you're in denial a little bit about... You know, I don't care <laughs> what I am. My dad's not well, and your job is to heal him, so fix it. All right, he's my dad. I'll decide what's best, understand? You don't seem to be understanding what I'm saying. <laughs> you need to understand that your dad's not going to get better. Yeah. What, what is it with you people, huh? 
It's all I've got. I, you can't do this. You've got to work on it. You've got to do something. <laughs> so when you deconstruct that, is there anything that didn't go well? <laughs> so what, what was the problems? So the father was never a focus. It's all about you as the family. What do you want? And he also, perhaps it, within it, is giving him the, saying to him, you have all the power, I need your permission, and he's not getting it. And then he sort of just goes around in circles with it. Uh, he, absolutely. So he's presented. So when did he put his cards on the table? I tried to put my cards on, I never tried to put my cards on the table. I try and see your cards and keep mine, all right? That's what you do in, in these negotiations. When does he put his cards on the table? First few seconds before the, he said anything. So yes, so then it's conflict after that. So then we told him, that, sorry, this is Steve Philpott, who's an excellent consultant, and this was all scripted. None of this is his words, they're all mine. Um, so the next time we turn him to t tell him about patient-centered again. So we're gonna try, focus on the patient. Stop focusing on the son. Focus, make, get the son to focus on the, pa on the patient. So we'll see if he gets a bit better there. Ian, my name's Steve. I'm one of the doctors here. I'm looking after your dad. Thanks for meeting with me. I think this is a very important conversation that we need to have. Things aren't going very well with your dad's treatment. And uh, I think it's very important that we do what's right for your dad. And I think what's right for your dad is to turn off his life support system. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want to lose it. I think... Uh, I think that we should do what's right for your dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I agree. I hear what you're saying and everything, but I, I, I want him to. Just, I want you to do some more for him to, to, to look after him. I mean, mm -hmm. just. No, oh, we'll look after him. We'll make sure he's not yeah. suffering. Uh, well, I've spoken to a lot of the other doctors here at the hospital, and we all agree that that the right thing for your dad now is to is to turn off the life support. I can't do that. I just. Wouldn't be right. It, uh, no, just wouldn't. I'm supposed to be looking after him. He, he, he's with me. We're together. You know, we, we we're family. I I, mm. I don't want that. I don't think your dad would have wanted this sort of treatment, though. Do you? I mean, you, your dad was very independent. I understand. Is that right? He did all right. I mean, uh, did your dad ever give you any information about what he would want if he was very sick? I don't think he would want this. I, we don't want him to suffer. Of course I don't want him to suffer. Yeah. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> What's going to happen now? I just want to find out a little bit more about your dad, if that's all right. Can you tell uh, me We might stop there. Do you think he's going to find out anything more? <laughs> and, uh, so... He's a good bloke. So, what, can, what, 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 what was not right there? Sorry? He's done it the wrong way around, finding out about the dad, letting him get there. Again, it's very directed. He puts his cards on the table. You know, he's not taking the son there. You know, he's saying what the father thinks. He's not say, letting the son say what the father thinks. And it's sort of like a bit, you know, he's gone a tiny step in the direction of patience. And that's what you see when, you know, when you don't really do it properly and doesn't get anywhere. So let's give him, you bring him a third chance? <laughs> right. And he's yeah, only my taking name's Steve. I'm one of the doctors here. I'm looking after Ben, your dad, at the moment. Thank you for sitting down with me. I think it's very important that we touch base and have a talk about your dad's treatment. Because your dad was so sick when he came into intensive care, I never got a chance to, to talk to him and get to know him. I wanted to ask you, if, if I can, to tell me a little bit about your dad. He's a good guy, you know, he's just one of those blokes, it's just, just a nice bloke, he was a good dad, he was, he was there, you know, when we were kids, always just, yeah, nothing spectacular, just a nice regular dad, he's, he's more of a mate than a dad, you know what I mean, mm. that, that, that kind of parent. And what yeah. sort of things did he does he enjoy doing? Well, 
<laughs> you know, he fancied himself as a bit of a ladies' man, you know, he liked to flirt and stuff, but you know, he loved mum and everything. She was number one as far as he was concerned. Yeah, you know, he was like most blokes, isn't it, with sports, you know? Mm -hmm. Had a soft spot for well, football, not Aussie football, but proper football. <laughs> you know, we won't go into that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you'd have a good debate with that bait, I'd say. Um, yeah, he was took us fishing. Although I, I never let him know that I really didn't like fishing. I just spent like spending time with him really. I just, but yeah, he's a good guy. Mm. He's a good guy. He was a good, you know, he was a good family man. I after Mum died, it, he wasn't the same bloke, you know. Something went out of him, you know, just spark or something. He took it bad. And then his health started to get a bit down after that. It just... So you said that since your mum died, his, his health has deteriorated a little bit. Can you tell me a little bit about what your dad's been like in the last 12 months or so? He's been really struggling, you know? can't do much himself, which really, he hates it, you know, you can see it, he can't always communicate it, but you can see it in his eyes and just his general demeanour, he's just not, it's not him, it's, it's hard for us because he's not the same bloke anymore, you know, he's not, he's not our dad, this was dad, life from soul the party, did stuff, you know, he's, now he's, he's struggling. He's really struggling with everything, you know, just keeping the food down, taking care of himself, just, he's a really independent guy, you know. Uh, I know he wouldn't want to be in this situation he's in now. He just, he wouldn't, it's not him, he wouldn't want that. It must be very hard for you to see, see your dad like that. Um, Ian, in, in light of what I've explained to you about your dad's current illness, and what our expectations of that are. What do you think your dad would be saying if he was involved in this conversation right now? He wouldn't want it drawn out. No, he, he wouldn't want to become one of them people that has to be spoon fed and everything done. It's just, no, he, he, he'd want it over. Well, I can. I can see that you love your dad very much and that you want to do what's best for him. Yeah, it is hard, but I wouldn't want him to suffer, you know? Just, yeah, just don't, don't make him suffer. Ian, my name's okay. Steve, That's I'm right. one of the doctors oh, here, again. I'm looking after. <laughs> so very different. And uh, no, 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 within the middle there's a little laughter about the soccer, you know, the soccer, the football stuff. And I mean, I find in these conversations, often if they're going nicely, a little bit, you know, there's some black humour or something in the middle that's, they're very reassuring. Um, letting him tell his story, taking him on a journey. Um, and so when I, you know, when people talk to me about difficult relatives, then the first two he's a difficult relative, but he isn't a difficult relative, he's a nice man who's been made into a monster by the doctor's, you know, approach. And when I'm, when I see, you know, and regularly see families that are said to be difficult, I think they've been made difficult. They're given mixed messages by all sorts of people, they're, they're, they don't know where they are, that all the conflict in the family comes out, and if you just listen and talk and let them do it, they're often not that difficult. Um, and. Uh, you know, letting people tell stories, telling the story. What does it, what would Dad say if he was here now? Tell me about how he's been over the last year. Um, and, and picking up on those things about deterioration. Because often we get patients who've had a fa fairly profound deterioration over the year or so before they've come in. I mean, that's our new model of, you know, you get people just before they hit the floor. And uh, we fiddle around for a little bit. So hopefully they're fun and interesting and useful. Now, in the last remaining minutes, we just want to take you through a goals of care document that they're using at Geelong Hospital. 
and then uh, then as soon as you've seen that and get a sense of what's available, if we don't know what happens in your hospitals or your ICUs, if we've got any time for questions, we'll take those questions. And then before people leave, and please don't leave early. I'll hand these around. Or we'll, we'll start we'll to hand around the evaluation forms. Well, actually, Charlie, why don't I do that and you just talk to this document? Well, no, you, um, do, you talk to it and I'll give it out. Or I can if you want me to. Um, oh, we just need your evaluation. You All right, yep. I'll talk to it since it's so mine. So here's the document that Charlie's <laughs> okay. going to talk you through. Okay, so we've now, with the process that we've just talked about, we've developed this form um, because we got so fed up with our um, goals of treatment form that we had before, resuscitation form, where you know everyone just ticked four, four, four CPR, four Mets, four everything, for NIV, for you know everything, everything, everything. And they just routinely tick it and they've done the box. It was just hopeless and we weren't getting anywhere. And a lot of them, you know, when we went back and had a look, and has there been any discussion with the patient whatsoever in the generation of this form? And the answer is no, none. So here, we, we dot the, 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 the first thing about uh, p p picking patients to have the conversation with. So in, in case you, I don't know whether you can see that, but the patient, if, if, the, if the patient, the MAPOA or, or the substitute decision maker request it, if there's an existing ACP, if there's a clinical indicator, and that's basically any of the palliative care triggers which predict that someone will be dead within, a, uh, has a 50% chance of being dead within a year, but as, as um, Bill has said to you, basically being in hospital and being over 70 um, gives you a good chance of being dead in a year anyway. So it's hard, you know, you can pick lots of people to have this conversation with. Um, the, 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 then coming from aged care or clinician initiated. And then the competence, is the patient competent? Oh. Oh, there you go. Look, it's big. <laughs> That's good. Okay, so there's, our, so there's our screening form for doing it, and then the competence, so is the patient competent? Because, you know, we get all this stuff about uh, is the patient competent to do it? So we just take the junior doctors through that to make it easy for them. And then we have these three steps that they have to do. So you put something down about the patient's preferences, values, and goals, and by asking the question, it actually encourages the doctors to ask them. Not a sin, I don't think to ask the patient what their preferences, values, and goals are, and we train them to do so. And then the medical advice, they're very resistant to filling out this box, but this is what I'm trying, what we're trying to get out of this is about what does the medical recommendation, what would be the reasonable treatment to recommend in this situation? Are we worried about it? You know, so, because I see so many patients where the, the doctor's suggesting a treatment, but the doctor's actually not that enthusiastic about the treatment, and the patients think that the doctor thinks that it's really good treatment, but the doctor's just doing it because they can't think of anything else to do. Um, so the medical advice about what's the situation, what are the chances of it working, what are the chances of complication, what are the chances of getting home? And then at the end of that, you put the two things together, what the patient wants and what the medical situation is, and an agreed plan. And then communicated with is very important about, have you told the family about it? And have you told the treating team about it? Because when the family and the treating team don't know, you've got trouble. So these steps, we tr t teach them, and we're getting an increase. When we started, we weren't getting very good compliance, but now we're getting much, much better compliance. We do this on every patient when they leave ICU. Our readmission to IC rate has gone down significantly. And on the ward, when we do these with patients on the ward who have the, the uh, uh, PAL care triggers, we are now admitting 40% less patients to ICU in that group. And so th these are the boxes that they could then, then the treatment decision should rest on what's happened above. And there's just the usual four uh, choices. So, uh, it, but it doesn't come from Nothing. There's a process to get there, and we're taking people through that process. So uh, it certainly we've reduced the by using it, we've reduced our readmission to ICU. We've reduced our, and interestingly, although we have a 40% less patients being admitted to ICU, we've just published that the death rate is identical. So you just die nicely on the ward rather than intubated in ICU. We're not sacrificing survival in this. We're just changing the way that people die. And from then, horrible to a bit better. And Charlie, on the back of the form... Yeah. Uh, th these are the gold standards. So these are the palliative care gold standards framework from the UK. 
So this is the, what they said was the, the criteria for referring to palliative care. So if it's a criteria for referring to palliative care, I think it's reasonable to have it as a criteria for a conversation. You know, refer, you know being referred to palliative care says something. So having a conversation, it's not outrageous, is it? So these are the things. And then we got the, 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 the frailty index, because frailty is a major thing which, which sits above uh, or in amongst uh, chronic illness. Being frail is not good. So the, the owner of this document is actually Geelong Hospital and it's through Neil Orford, the director there. So I asked Charlie beforehand, I mean, if, if any of you are thinking this is a fantastic document, you need to go through Charlie, who would ask Neil, yeah. is it possible for your hospital or your ICU Let's to start using this? Him. If that's the case, then it may be that we're collecting, going to collect data and we can collect it at more hospitals more quickly to publish, mm. but you need to go through Charlie to get access to this document. Yeah, just out of, so I can ask Neil rather than, it, I'm not sure what he's thinking about how, how it, it disseminates, but I think we'd probably be interested in it. If anyone's seriously interested in the process, um, it'd be a good thing. So it's five minutes to 12. We, we could probably take another half hour of questions, but we don't have that time. If you think this has been a valuable workshop, then please assist us in ensuring that these workshops continue in, in future conferences by filling out your evaluation form. And that way, if you give us positive feedback, we can ensure that we can help other participants at future conferences. While you're filling out the valuation forms, and please make sure you fill them out and then um, Gerald, do you mind taking them at the door as people leave? Is that right? Any other final questions or comments in the remaining five minutes? Um, what year is Sorry? What year is oh, send it to me and I'll, send, I'll forward them to him. So Charlie, Char, Charlie Cork at hotmail.com. Is it charlie.cork or Charlie? No, no dots. <laughs> charlie Cork, C-H-A-R-L-I-E-C-O-R-K-E at hotmail.com and I'll forward them on to Neil. So it's cork with an E at yeah. hotmail.com. I think you mentioned before that those videos form part of the training in the college. College training, yes. In my naivety, I just need to ask, does, do medical students, interns, do any training around advanced care end-of-life care as part of their curriculum? Look, I, can't, I mean, I think for medical students, it depends on the medical school they go to, but generally, I think they're not... Uh, it, the the, the decision-making right at the end... You know, they do breaking bad news, and it sort of stops for many medical schools. The actual thing about, I need to break bad news to you, and then we may need to make a decision, that bit, that second bit, seems to be absent in many of the courses. Certainly at Deakin, we, because I'm something to do with it, um, we, we do a lot of that. But, um, yeah, so but Charlie's, Charlie's colleagues at Deakin do this. Mm. I helped to run this at Melbourne Uni yeah. for the medical students. Um, if you've got students at other schools that need to have this, then we're more than happy to be approached about how to get this going. But you're quite right. Both medical and nursing students need this. Yeah. Um, and, the, and the ones who are in there as registrars at the moment suffer, you know, just haven't got it. Um, there was a big hole and of course, and I find, I mean, I do the teaching and I find that the teaching the, re the medical students is relatively easy. Teaching registrars is slightly trickier. Teaching consultants is really hard. Mm -hmm. All right. Question or comment? Uh, I just... Uh, you did say nurses at the end there. I think, you know, this is less of a question but more of a statement that there's also a huge gap in, in nurses, you know, education with, with, with regard to this stuff. And as you said before, they play such a, a central role in, in, in what they can achieve with, with families and patients, you know. Um, yep. So something to be said for the future anyway. And we've been involved in getting this into La Trobe Nursing School. Um, all this stuff I can just do in Melbourne. But um, again, if any of you want assistance in getting this happening in other nursing or medical schools, um, get in touch with us. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, assessing capacity for patients. What about patients who are in an acute phase of their illness? So we, for example, have a lot of patients who are with the new high spinal injury. And at that point, when you ask them, is this what you want? They've just had a new injury. Are they in a position to be able to say, I don't want this? Uh, you know, it, it, it's just a difficult situation. How do you assess capacity in those situations? Can I comment on that? Because yeah. I spent 20 years working at the Austin Hospital, which is the spinal unit in Victoria. 
We had a number of uh, high quads who were obviously ventilator dependent but we could manage their tracheostomy or even through the, uh, while intubated and you get clever about asking questions so that they can answer with a nod or a shake of the head and you always reverse the question so you're absolutely clear about what they're saying. Mm -hmm. So we've had at least, um, when I was involved there, at least two high ventilator dependent quads who ended up indicating to us not only did they not want to have any further surgery, they wanted treatment to be withdrawn, but they also became multi-organ donors. And we had the psychiatrists involved to assess their capacity. Of course they're depressed. I mean, no one's going to say an acute quad's not depressed. I mean, there'd have to be something weird if they weren't. But it didn't mean that they couldn't, while depressed, still be involved and be capable of making decisions. And we, you know, we went through a proper process before doing that. So, sure, in acute illness, people can still make decisions as long as you get the psychs involved to confirm that they had decision-making capacity. And particularly what they rely on is, can the person envisage what the alternative would be and talk about it in a competent way so that then they can indicate, look, absolutely, I can think about what it would be like to be quadriplegic. I've always never wanted to be in that situation. If you're telling me I'll be ventilator dependent and I'm particularly I'm not going to be able to move my arms and legs, then that's definitely yeah. something I don't want. And having it repeated over a period of time, so the thing about uh, asking a patient one day and asking them again the next day, not just at one point in time. If it's consistent, it, it, it has more validity than a one-off. You know, I wouldn't take that as a one-off thing. I'd like to ask that over a period of time. But if someone's consistent over a period of time, and Bill said the psychiatrist, I mean, the psychiatrists don't like being involved in having to work out whether someone's competent. They always fight it and say it's not our job but uh, medical legally, it's reassuring. One final question or comment before we stop. Yep. I suppose following on from that capacity assessment, I had a recent run-in with a medical team who insisted on a patient's incapacity um, when actually the patient probably had capacity. Mm. Um, the patient, that was based on the fact the patient had self-discharged three weeks beforehand. Um, they called psych, the psych reg over the phone said, oh no, the patient probably doesn't have capacity because that's what you think to the medical team. Um, how would you deal with that situation? Well, it's very difficult. You've, you, you know, we're, we're very bad at saying, <coughs> I had a patient, an elderly 90-year-old, who had a, um, a big uh, middle cerebral artery, so yeah, having, set, having an advanced care plan saying he didn't want anything. And you know, they asked him in emergency, and he sort of mumbled, and they said he said yes. And so he had capacity then. And then a, a couple of days later, he's going, you wouldn't do this to a dog. Um, you know, mumbling um, again, but, uh, and they said, oh no, he hasn't got capacity when he's saying that. And then there was a bit later on, so every time he said something they agreed with, he had capacity, and every time he said something they didn't agree with, he didn't have capacity, and we're very naughty at doing it. So you've just got to be honest about it. And I'm always telling the, you know, the registrars, you know, capacity means, uh, an autonomy and capacity means that, you know, you've got to respect what someone's saying. It's not about whether you agree with it. It's about whether that, you know, that process that Bill talked about, about whether they can process it. And, it, and, and that, that comment from the lawyer about not having to have a real rational reason why that you agree with is a very good uh, test of it. And I think the test of a good doctor and nurse is that you occasionally, or more, perhaps more than occasionally, can accept what someone's saying when you think it's absolutely crazy uh, but it's really what they want and you don't argue and suck about it. You accept it. Not everybody agrees with us. Um, that's how it is. So if you have any further questions or comments or want to uh, connect with Charlie, you've got his email address. My email address, if you want to connect with me, is william.sylvester, so my name, dot sylvester, at icloud.com. And thanks very much from both of us for attending. Mm. It's been great fun. Um, by word of mouth, feed on to other people whether you think this is worthwhile, and please do your evaluations and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. And the last session in the whole conference on Saturday, we're doing a hypothetical on withdrawal of treatment on a patient. So I uh, look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everybody. That's good, Bill. Well done.